Hi everyone, this is Carrie Cassidy from Project Camelot and we are here with Michael Schratt. We're about to discuss his new book which is called Retrievals of the Third Kind and uh, now you see it front and center on the screen. So welcome Michael, uh, it's, it's lovely to have you on, on the air here and uh, I'm very excited to go through your book with you and uh, this book will be available tomorrow, are you saying? Uh, I would say early this week, early this week, yes. Okay, and gonna it's going to be available on the MUFON website, uh, and although I've got a, an, a bio, a short bio for you on the on this announcement for, for this live event today, I'd like you to give some of your background and then we'll launch into the various cases and we'll show the, the really wonderful pictures from the book. That much we're going to be allowed to do, I believe, and... Uh, this should be a very interesting uh, saga going going through the Leonard Stringfield uh, crash retrievals uh, that have been, from what I understand, uh, it was his in-depth research that you uncovered and were given access to by MUFON. Is that correct? Uh, MUFON acquired 65 three-ring binders during July of 2012. That was one of the significant breakthroughs that was announced uh, for the MUFON Symposium of July 2012, and that's where this originated from. Okay, very good. Uh, so at this moment, can you give some of your background, Michael? Sure. No problem, Carrie. Well, as you know, Carrie, we, we've spoken uh, many times before. I am a, consider myself a military aerospace historian. I'm a concerned citizen. Uh, I want to find out where my tax dollars are disappearing. Um, I'm very concerned about uh, things that were going on in the military industrial complex over the last 40 years. Uh, definitely interested in secret, classified, unacknowledged special access programs, and I've made it my goal to expose these programs and get the technology out into the hands of the scientific community. Okay, great. Uh, so along those lines, uh, you have also, as I have said, you've actually interviewed a number of uh, individuals who worked for, for NASA. I believe you've interviewed some of the Skunk Works people, is that correct? I've definitely interviewed a number of Skunk Works employees, yes, correct. People who work for Ben Rich. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Uh, and I, I, I don't know if people really understand the significance of that, but it is, is, it is important. Um, for people to understand that that is uh, that Ben Rich uh, said some really amazing things, and do you recall? Uh, I I think one of the things he said, paraphrasing, uh, "We have the technology to take ET home." Uh, that was just one of many uh, very uh, mysterious statements that he made, indicating that the secret space program was much farther along than most people understood or believed. Uh, at the time that he made those statements, which I think he was he was uh, perhaps about to die or 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 even in a hospital bed at the time. The statement that you're referring to, Carrie, was made at the Air Force Museum back in 1992, and that was the very last slide of his uh, presentation. It wasn't a PowerPoint back then; it was a slide presentation, and that was the last thing he said. Uh, ben died in 1995. I've spoken to a number of Skunk Works engineers, and they're familiar with these statements that Ben has made. You know, and I have to be honest about what they said. They they basically made the, the statement that some of these statements by Ben were designed to further the morale of engineers at the Skunk Works and to further the mys mystique of Lockheed Skunk Works. That may be the case, but uh, others like Jan Harzan believe that there was more to it and he was trying to release some of that technology before he passed away in 95. Okay, uh, yeah, I have to say that it's, um, there were a number of statements made, not just in that, uh, that speech, but, but I have uh, information that he, he also was, uh, was on his hospital bed saying some similar statements um, and some other even more in-depth statements about what they actually had. So, um, so, so, it's unlikely that he was out and out lying. Oh, absolutely. And I do have uh, the official Lockheed Skunk Works company letterhead written uh, specifically by Ben Rich, and uh, this was in response to a inquiry that John Andrews had uh, made to Ben, 
And the, the response from Ben was that he was a believer in both man-made and extraterrestrial UFOs, and so was Kelly Johnson. <laughs> okay, and Kelly Johnson was, was who for the people listening? Kelly Johnson was the originator of the Skunk Works, and then uh, after he retired, uh, Ben Rich took over the reins in 1975, and then that lasted until 1991 when Ben retired. Okay, very good. Uh, so at this moment, please explain who Leonard Stringfield was and why his files might be important to the world at this time. Okay, sure, Carrie. Uh, I'm going to take this uh, right off a couple of specs that I, I have on... Uh, on Leonard here. He was born in 1920. He grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, interesting, Carrie, that by graduating of high school in 1939, he memorized the entire dictionary, which I thought was a very interesting accomplishment. Uh, he joined the military the second he heard about the attack on Pearl Harbor. I mean, immediately. He just signed up immediately. Uh, after the war, he was employed by a chemical company in Ohio. He retired after 30 years. He wrote two books, uh, one in 1957 called so Inside Saucer Post 3-0. The other one was published in 1977. It was called The UFO Siege. I uh, also want to point out, Kerry, that his lecture in 1978 at the New Farm International Symposium in Dayton, Ohio, absolutely caused a sensation because this was the first time that the term UFO crash retrieval had really been heard. I mean... Prior to that, it was Frank Scully, but that, that term wasn't coined until 78 when he, he gave his lecture there. And just as a background on how this all came about, Kerry, near the conclusion of that lecture in Dayton back in 78, uh, Leonard put out a request to anyone in the audience who either was a first-hand eyewitness or knew someone who was a first-hand eyewitness or who had first-hand experience dealing with alien cadavers at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, perhaps at the Aero Med Lab, or someone who was on a UFO crash retrieval team. So this is the, the thing that he sent out to the listening audience. Now, as, as it's been stated by Leonard, uh, he took about a two-week vacation with his wife, Dell, after the symposium. And when he got back, uh, Carrie, he went to the post office and opened up his post office box, as we had mentioned before, and he looked inside there, and there was nothing there, Kerry. There, there was absolutely nothing there. So he looked a little bit closer, and uh, he saw a little slip at the bottom of that post office box. And he pulled it out, looked at it, and it said, uh, see postmaster. So he walked over to the postmaster, and this is a true story. And he gave it to the postmaster, and the gentleman said, uh, just stay there for a few minutes. I'll be back. And then two large, burly men had these gigantic <laughs> ale bags over their shoulders and bringing it back to Leonard Springfield. Kerry, there were 6,000 letters from all around the United States with people who had first-hand knowledge of alien cadavers, people had, who were on the crash retrieval teams, the Blue Boy teams. Wow. And so wow. this really represents the bombshell material that all of us in ufology have been waiting for. Now the problem is, Kerry, this particular information has been kept under the jurisdiction of Leonard's widow, who is Dell Stringfield in Cincinnati, and she will by no means, repeat, by no means let anyone have access to the 40 bank boxes of material that are inside her garage. So the best that we have at this time, Carrier, are the 65 three-ring binders that were acquired by Leonard's personal secretary, and that's the information that we'll be covering tonight. Okay. Uh... Incredible. Okay, so at this moment, for some reason, we're having a very weird uh, audio issue. I don't know why. Um, but uh, I guess the best thing we can do to stop this loop is is for you to mute yourself when, when I talk, which is not going to be that often, uh, Michael, and then unmute yourself uh, when you're ready to speak, okay? Uh, when you're ready to... To, to begin uh, again. So at this moment, uh, just for the, the, the listener's sake, uh, because there is a weird loop happening, uh, we need to do this. Um, so at this moment, what I'm going to ask, if, if you will start with an introduction, uh, describe why you were propelled to, to, to put, compile this book, 
um, and what your experience was when you first encountered their files. Uh, we have covered a bit of this in, in a few prior interviews, uh, just briefly, but if we could go over that uh, at the beginning here, and then we'll just go into the cases, and you tell me the case, I will flip to the, to the picture of that case, okay? Sure, Carrie. Sure, Carrie. The reason why I was compelled to pursue this information is because I personally felt that Leonard was closer to anyone within ufology to the actual information. Uh, when, when he spoke to people who were there at night when a DC-7 arrived at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, he personally talked to the gentleman who saw them offload the crates that had two male and one female alien cadaver inside the crates. That's the level that's the seriousness and high caliber of Leonard's military sources. So I personally felt that he was closer than anyone to the truth, and that's why I pursued it. Okay. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your encounter with the uh, material in the, I guess it was a garage that you visited? Uh, well, when it was announced that the 65 three-ring binders would be uh, made available and scanned in by, by MUFON in July of 2012, I immediately jumped on it, Kerry. I felt that this is so important, so valuable to our national history that uh, I needed to follow up on it immediately. And I personally thought I was like number 100 in line. I figured there'd be all these people ahead of me. I was already too late. So uh, I, I petitioned uh, David McDonald, who was the MUFON International Director at the time. I filled out the appropriate paperwork. I sent in my application. It had to be reviewed by the MUFON board members. Uh, I made the agreement that uh, if I would be given access to the collection, I would provide them with weekly briefings of all the material that I uncovered, and then I would uh, create an illustration, full-color illustration of the case, and a historical background spec sheet to go with that, and then that would be given to MUFON for inclusion in a book, which hopefully it will be released tomorrow, and for uh, MUFON's personal uh historical archives, and that was the agreement, and I, I held up my end of the bargain. Okay, uh, and good for you. Uh, so at this moment, let's start with, uh, if even the cover of the book, if you don't mind giving a, a short explanation for these uh, fascinating photos on the cover here, and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to attempt to, first people have been able to see this first one, but there's actually a couple more I'm going to scroll down here. And, okay. and let people see those as well. That's fine, Carrie. Um, while you're doing that, a couple of things I, I want to mention very briefly, just a couple of a quick quotes that I thought were important. Uh, the first one is from Richard Dolan, who's such a, a great guy, you just can't beat Richard. Uh, number one, this is from Richard, since World War II, 50% of all documents created by the United States government have been classified top secret. Therefore, that means that we have essentially lost 50% of our national history. So in essence, Carrie, we don't even know what's been going on the last 50, 60 years. We have been completely left out of the loop. Absolutely. And uh, I want people to know that this is, this is why we are doing this tonight. Uh, and this is also why we have been uh, interviewing you repeatedly, Michael, and encouraging you to also write articles that can be posted on Camelot because you as a an aerospace historian are, are cover, covering some very vital ground that we are losing sight of uh, on a daily basis and that the American people and the world, for that matter, are not being uh, let in on. And, and you're one of the few people documenting this information. I know Rich Dolan has written, uh, I believe it's a two-volume set, uh, UFOs in the Na National Security State. But um, in, in terms of the color illustrations and photographs and uh, getting very in deep to these various subjects, you are, from to my knowledge, one of the few people really getting in, in there and covering these things. Thanks, Kerry. Hope so. Hope so. Uh, the next quote really quickly is by the general public. And according to the general public, Kerry, UFO crash retrievals can't be true because if they were, I would have read about them in the local newspaper. Uh, you know, <laughs> You're never going to hear about these crash retrieval cases in the local newspaper because this is the blackest of the black. It's already been stated that the subject of UFOs was classified many times higher than the atomic bomb. So we are talking about the deepest black USAP programs that there are. 
the next one quickly, Kerry, is from James Clarkson. You, you may know him. He's a great researcher. He said, don't believe anything until it's officially denied, which I think makes <laughs> a lot of sense. So we, I, I think we have that uh, in spades with ufology, and so uh, taking that into account, uh, if you could, again, just talk about three photos that are, or they're not actually photos, I guess they're drawings, but they're so lifelike uh, that they look like photos on the front page of the book. So you want to go there. Okay, that's fine. The cover. Uh, the very first illustration that you'll see on the cover of the book is the UFO forced landing that took place on May 18, 1953, near Kingman, Arizona. This is a forensic composite illustration that uh, was done by John McNeil. I commissioned John McNeil. He's a very good computer artist, and I want to give him credit for that. Um, I interviewed Harry Drew, who needs to get credit for this information. Harry Drew is the primary researcher on the Kingman UFO forced landing event. Um, the original story broke in the early 1970s by Raymond Fowler, who interviewed Arthur Stanzel. But prior, after that time, Harry Drew has done more good work on, on Kingman than anyone on this planet, period. There's, there's no question about it. So that is who created um, the first one. Uh, he, John McNeil also created the one on the lower left. That is the 1963 Marine UFO case. And he also created the 1973 Jackie Gleason alien encounter at Homestead Air Force Base, Florida, along with Richard Nixon. So that's exactly who created these illustrations. Okay, excellent. Uh, and where do you want to go from here? Okay, well, uh, what I'd like to do then, Carrie, is uh, just speak about who these sources were that uh, Leonard used to get this information. Because he didn't just uh, come up with this on his own. I want to, you know, very briefly talk about where, where he got this information, what the sources were. And, and according to Leonard, the sources for the cases were three-star U.S. Air Force generals, U.S. Air Force pilots, astronauts, commercial pilots, air traffic controllers. There were neurosurgeons in these cases, Carrie. There were pathologists, theoretical physicists, and mathematicians, U.S. Army officers, U.S. Navy officers, people who worked at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base that handled the cadavers uh, back in 1953. So that's a brief overview of some of the people that uh, Leonard interviewed to get this information. Okay. Uh, was he in touch with the people at Roswell? Well, some of these people talked about Roswell, but primarily it was uh, sources that came to him who worked at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base who were military guards, uh, naval personnel um, at Great Lakes Naval Training Center. It was these type people who discussed these serious matters with Leonard. Okay. Right. So, yeah, let's let's go to the first one, Carrie. Uh, reference number one on page one. This is the Kingman UFO Force Landing. Let's go to that one first. Okay. Uh, and is this, uh, because I, I want to get the right picture, Right. Are we talking about what's on the uh, front page of? Yes, yes, we are. And, mm -hmm. and let me let me just briefly put here is Leonard Stringfield for for people that would like to see a picture of him before we we continue here. I'm just we're, what we're doing is just grabbing really quickly uh, pictures of the base, and uh, and and so I'll have to I'll go back to the 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 only place of that that drawing that I'm aware of is the front page of, of the book, the, the actual cover of the book. Yeah, it's, it should also appear on, on page one as well, so. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, according to, to Harry Drew and also according to Arthur Stanzel, uh, and this is coming directly from the primary eyewitness, uh, the, the first thing we have to mention when we talk about the Kingman event is that there are three separate events, Carrie. There is not just one event. The first event that happened on May 18, 1953 was in point of fact a forced landing. It was not a crash. The other two subsequent events that we won't be discussing here because I want to talk about the main event were actual crash retrievals. So that's the, the first thing to keep in mind is that there are three separate events. According to Harry Drew, uh, this disc-shaped craft 
accidentally, we don't know how, we don't know why, but somehow it accidentally flew into a high-powered experimental radar range that was triangulated. They were boosting up the power between 6 and 20 times, and this craft that was approximately 30 feet in diameter, 14 feet high, flew into this radar net. And incidentally, Carrie, I think we should mention that there were hundreds of birds that were dropping like flies as they flew into this radar uh, area. So there was a, a tremendous amount of high-powered microwave radiation going through this area. And somehow when this craft flew into this radar range, it upset or disturbed the either the navigation system or the propulsion system, and it made a forced landing. It came down, it rested at a 15-degree angle carry, and it was about 20 inches buried into the soil. That's what it looked like. Within two hours, there was a rapid response U.S. Air Force team on the site, uh, but of course, they didn't have any military presence there because by 1945, uh, the U.S. military had moved out of Kingman. So there was no military presence at Kingman. They had to come from other areas. Uh, there was a, a separate team that originated from Indian Springs that flew into Phoenix, according to Harry Drew. And this was a group of 40 scientists and specialists and engineers who boarded a General Motors 3301 1952 bus and took a four-hour ride carry up to the site. And when they got there, uh, they, were, uh, they disembarked the bus one at a time according to their specialty. And when they arrived at the scene, they saw this dish-shaped craft that was tilted up at a 15-degree angle. Uh, it had a door or a hatch that was about 1.5 feet wide, 3.5 feet in length. There was uh, two very high-powered, what they called Army Lightall-type lighting systems that were shining down on this because this all happened at night. They arrived three days after the crash, uh, after the forced landing. There were also four pyramidal-like tents that were set up as well. Uh, eyewitnesses stated that the craft had a series of slots around the circumference of the craft, and they also mentioned that four beams were also recovered, and they were perfectly fine. The craft was unharmed, and the beams were unharmed as well, Carrie. Okay. Now, the second part of this, uh, again, comes from Harry Jew. So we have to ask ourselves, where, what are they going to do with this disc? Uh, are they going to leave it out there? Can they bring it somewhere? They had to take this disc out as quickly as they could possibly do, uh, but this had to be done efficiently. So an M25 tank transporter carry from Fort Irwin made the trip all the way to Kingman, Arizona. And by way of a crane, they tried to place this disc on the top of the M25 tank transporter. Um, there's a picture of this in the book as well. Um, you know, maybe we can go to that later. But the problem they had, carry is when they tried to place this disc on the top of the M25 tank transporter, it would not sit level. It was still at that strange 15 degree angle carry. So they had to build a cradle out of these eight by eight timbers in order to support this craft for transportation. So we don't know why, but there must be some type of residual propulsion system still associated with the craft upon retrieval because it wouldn't sit correctly on the uh, tank transporter itself. So, and again, keep in mind, this is all at night. This, this technically hasn't been uh, rehearsed too many times because this isn't too far after Roswell. So then they started making the trip from Kingman. And, you know, I originally thought, and I, and I questioned this to Harry Drew. I said, Harry, I know you mentioned that they took it to Groom Lake, Area 51. But why wouldn't they take it to Nellis Air Force Base, which is 90 miles closer? And, and Harry's answer was, Kerry, that it just wasn't a secure base at that time. So what they ended up doing is they came up with a plan to cross the Colorado River. But back at that time in 1953, Kerry, the Hoover Dam does not appear today as it appeared back in 1953. There are concrete pylons that were much closer into the road. And there were big lights that overhung the road section. So driving this tank transporter with a flying saucer on top 
over the Hoover Dam back in May of 1953 was completely out of the question. They had to come up with another way to get across the Colorado River. So they devised a plan to roll or drive the M21, uh, M25 tank transporter up onto a floating barge. And then these guide cables were strung across the Colorado River. And then they would tow this entire barge with the M25 on top across the Colorado River. This is all at night. And so that is the, the plan that they started with. Unfortunately, Kerry, the guide wire on this particular operation came loose and the whole barb starting started floating down the, hollow, the Colorado River. They eventually got it reattached again, Carrie, and it happened again. It happened again. <laughs> this time, Carrie, and this is all from Harry Drew. Harry Drew must get credit for this information. This time, when it got loose, it went all the way down the Colorado River and slammed against the north face of the Colorado uh, of the Hoover Dam, Carrie. If you can imagine that, so. You know, the scene is these military personnel, they're, they're screaming, it's chaotic, there's, there's running going around, there's flashlights being dropped, there's yelling, it's a very chaotic situation. They eventually brought the, uh, the barge across the river and they made it to Groom Lake. Incredible. Great. So I'm Great looking, Carrie, for a, a really nice photograph of the Hoover Dam North Face and if this is true, which we believe it to be, there may be an indication of a scuff mark or an indentation or some type of a major scratch or even a patchwork where they patched something where this took place. That would help to confirm the event. Okay. <laughs> Very cool. That, well, uh, the word is out. So we put the word out, and uh, if there's anyone out there who uh, was around at that time and had pictures of, of the Hoover Dam, it'd be fascinating to find that out. Sure, we'd love to hear from someone who perhaps was there or knows someone that does that could substantiate the claims, but that is the that essentially is the case per Harry Drew, absolutely. Okay, uh, I'd never heard that part about uh, trying to transport it, so that's uh, very, very interesting information. Uh, Go right ahead. So, so are we on the next case? Or, okay, or? let's go to reference number six, Carrie. That's page 15. Okay, one moment. And just so everyone understands what's going on here, we are not allowed to, uh, you know, obviously make this book readable online. Uh, we are, are simply going to be sort of skimming past these pages so that we don't violate any kind of uh, agreement that Michael has made with move on and we want to make sure to just show the pictures. So, sure. Okay. That's here. Uh, so we are, I believe now on the illustration on page 15. Correct. Correct. Okay. So this case uh, is part of the Leonard Springfield collection. I felt that this is one of the most significant cases in the entire collection. After looking at this, I, I felt this one perhaps might be the most significant. Um, according to Michael Johnstone, who wrote her a letter to Leonard, which is in the collection in the Three Ring Binder, he said that he contacted a United States Marine. This is back in 1963 when this happened. Uh, and, and this particular Marine told Michael Johnstone that he boarded a blacked out plane, the, the windows were blacked out from Cherry Point, North Carolina. That's where this originated from. And he took a three hour flight, but he does not know the destination point. He was never told where he would end up. He was, he was just, he just mentioned that he was on a three hour flight with blacked out windows and went to an undisclosed military facility or some type of a aircraft hangar. And his job was to guard what you see in this picture. And basically he stated that when he got there, he saw this very interesting hamburger shaped UFO that measured 40 feet in diameter. It was 15 feet tall. It had approximately 10 elliptical shaped windows around the outer circumference of the vehicle. The, the interesting thing here is that these windows were smoked over. They were opaque. You could not see through these windows. So there was no indication of anything on the interior. Uh, he also mentioned that there was a one-inch lip or step between the craft itself and where the windows were indented into the craft. 
The other interesting thing, Kerry, is he said that this thing was extremely smooth, like polished aluminum. Um, he also mentioned that there, there definitely was indications of a hatch, but he said that the seams on this thing were so tight, so precisionly machined, you could not put a razor blade in there. It was just perfectly done, perfectly done, like it was spun on a lathe or a potter's wheel, almost out of one complete piece. And we've heard that motif before a number of times. Um, so basically, when he got in there, he saw this craft uh, that was basically on the scaffolding. He called it aircraft scaffolding, about five feet off the floor. That's what you see in the illustration. There were military uh, guards around this thing. There was a white circle around the bottom circumference of the whole uh, operation. And what they were doing is they had two teams of white lab coat technicians that were trying to breach the hull of this craft carry. This is 1963 again. And according to the military source interviewed by Michael Johnston, he said that they first started with diamond tip drill bits to breach the hull of the craft, which failed. Then he said they moved to a high-powered acetylene torch, which also failed, Kerry. The third and final attempt is what you see in this illustration. You'll notice off to the left, there are two high-powered electrical cables going up to an arc device. They use some type of a high-powered laser back in 63. That seems a little odd, but this is what he said. And he said that the power source for this laser were two large 18-wheeler tractor trailers that were parked outside the hangar. They were providing the electrical power for this particular device. And he said even with this, they could not breach the hole. After the two weeks that he guarded on the very last day when he got there, the dish-shaped craft was no longer in the hangar. It was on top of an 18-wheeler low-boy tractor trailer. They were putting a tarp on the craft. And he never saw it again, Carrie. <laughs> okay, very interesting. Uh, great illustration. And, and here's a little more detail for the viewers from the book. Yeah, I mean, so in, instead of just reading text in this book, um, I, I have really tried hard to accurately represent what this looks like. And I did show this to Michael Johnstone. He said this is the closest it's ever been since he uh, interviewed him. I, I will also mention, Kerry, that according to the military source who was there at the time, he also took a photograph of this craft, Kerry, on the, on the scaffolding um, because he was the senior guard who was checking everyone else into the facility. So no one technically checked him, Carrie. So he actually snapped off a photograph of this thing. And so I thought, wow, if we could get a, a copy of that photograph, it'd be great. But according to Michael Johnstone, that photograph was lost in a flood back in 1981. So we just don't have a photograph. <laughs> okay. I'm going to try That's to believe, I'm going to try to believe that, uh, but very interesting. Okay. okay. Okay, so that's basically uh, reference number six, 1963 Marine case. I'd like to move on to uh, Gordon Cooper's intercept in 1951. This is reference 11, page 24, period. Okay, one okay. moment. Okay. Okay. So when you talk about Gordon Cooper, and I'm sure many within this field, they're very familiar with Gordon Cooper. There, there's three things that we should mention about Gordon Cooper, Kerry. Number one is his personal letter to the United Nations regarding UFOs in 1978. That's the first thing. The second thing is what we're going to cover now is his attempted UFO intercept over West Germany in 1951. The third and final factor here, Kerry, is his UFO involvement in a landing at Edwards Air Force Base in 1957. So what you should see on the screen, Kerry, are two F-86 Sabre jets climbing at a 60-degree angle trying to intercept a group of dish-shaped craft. This is a true story. Uh, it's well known within ufology. Astronaut Gordon Cooper was an impeccable witness. He later was a Mercury astronaut. 
According to Gordon Cooper, when he was stationed at West Germany for a period of two weeks, they were buzzed by squadrons of what he called dish-shaped silvery discs that were flying over the West German airfield at the time. So basically, he decided to take matters into his own hands, and he got uh, his squadron mate with him, his wingmen. So they got in their F-86, they climbed to 20,000 feet altitude, they pushed full power, uh, uh, max power on the F-86, they did a slight nose-down attitude, then pulled up and did a zoom climb and tried to intercept these saucers that were flying over their Air Force base back in 1951 in West Germany. Kerry, they could not do it. According to Gordon Cooper, they were too high and too fast. So someone back in 1951 was flying dish-shaped craft that had no visible means of propulsion. No, uh, There were no jet engines. There were no visible ailerons, no propellers. He also mentioned that these craft were making zigzagging movements and uh, retracing their flight path at 180-degree uh, angles. So I just asked the question, Kerry, who had the technology in 1951 to do this? Uh, it's known at the, unknown at this time what government agency or if this, in point of fact, was an ET craft. Very, very interesting. Okay. Uh, go right ahead, Michael. Again, my, uh, the sound is, is really bad on my side, but uh, you, you please do continue. Okay, I will continue, Kerry. Let's go ahead and move on to page 27, Carrie. And there we, will, we should see the other event that Gordon Cooper was involved in. It should be page 27. And you should see a uh, flying saucer on a dry lake bed. Hopefully we do. So according to Gordon Cooper, he was um, commanded to essentially film the installation of precision landing equipment at Edwards Air Force Base. And uh, this is 1957, Edwards Air Force Base, north of Los Angeles, California. And out of nowhere, a 30-foot diameter disc started hovering over the dry lake bed. It extended out three landing gear legs landed on the dry lake bed, it sat there for about one minute, then hovered over the dry lake bed at about 20 feet, it retracted in the landing gear legs and then flew off at a medium rate of speed, and all of this was caught on Air Force film motion picture film reel carry. At that point, the film was brought back to the uh, developing laboratory at Edwards Air Force Base. The film was developed. It was seen by astronaut Gordon Cooper. He did not run it through a, a projector, though. So he did not actually view the film itself. He just, he just looked at the film reel. It was never run through a projector. At that point, an Air Force courier from um, either Bowling Air Force Base or uh, headquarters in Washington, D.C., Air Force Headquarters, Washington, D.C., flew to Edwards Air Force Base. Uh, he chained that particular footage right to his wrist on a briefcase and flown right back to Washington, D.C., and carry that footage has never been seen since that time. <laughs> so we have got the evidence. They have got it. And you know if they have this, they probably have warehouses full of this from gun camera footage starting in 19, perhaps 1942, somewhere around that time frame. Carrie, you know they've got thousands of these things, and that's the kind of information that would really be required to, you know, bring about the disclosure that Richard Dolan talks about, something that we've all been hoping for. Amazing. Okay, okay. and okay. Gordon Cooper, okay. uh, certainly an impeccable witness, uh, definitely. Absolutely an impeccable witness, absolutely. No, no doubt about it. Okay, Carrie, I'd like to move on to uh, page 31 if we can, Carrie. Okay. I love this case, Carrie. It's just great. <laughs> okay, so what, what we should have on the screen then, and just a couple of, a little bit of background information now. The first part of this story, Carrie, is 100% true. Never been, it's never been challenged. Uh, this is 1973. This is at a uh, 
a charity golf outing with Richard Nixon and comedian Jackie Gleason. Never, never been disputed that this part of the story is correct. This is February 19th, 1973. Somewhere around the ninth hole, carry the subject of UFOs came up, and I will mention that it's well known that Jackie Gleason was a huge paranormal fan. He had thousands of UFO books. He had a home that was built in the shape of a round flying saucer. <laughs> He had paranormal books. He had UFO books. He was crazy about the subject of UFOs. No, no doubt. It, it's never been questioned. So, you know, of course, Jackie Gleason approached Richard Nixon on the golf course, and you know, the subject came up, and they were talking about it. And, you know, he really didn't think too much more about it. And when the golf charity golf outing was done, Jackie Gleason went home. And according to Clark McClellan, who, Kerry, you've interviewed personally, who has verified this story, and... Beverly McKittrick, which is Jackie Gleason's ex-wife, who also claimed that the story is true, somewhere around 12 midnight comes a knock on Jackie Gleason's door at 12 midnight. And so Jackie Gleason opens up this door, and it's none other than President Richard Nixon all alone at Jackie Gleason's door at 12 midnight. Now, there's been some contradictory evidence to suggest that there's no way that the president could uh, escape the Secret Service. But other authors have stated that Richard Nixon had a habit of leaving his Secret Service agents behind and did do things uh, with no protection and did co kind of go out on his own. So as the story goes, Carrie, uh, Richard Nixon says, uh, Jackie, you remember what we were talking about on the golf course today? And Jackie says, well, of course. And he said, I think I can help you with that. Why don't you come follow me? So he puts Jackie in his own car. They drive to Homestead Air Force Base in Florida. They're met by a security guard. Uh, the security guard waves them through. They're, they're escorted to the far portion of Homestead Air Force Base. And then another security guard uh, brings them into a secure facility or aircraft hangar on the far end of Homestead Air Force Base. And once inside... Jackie Gleason is met with six vintage, quote, Coke freezers, Carrie. That was not my word. This was according to uh, Clark McClellan, who interviewed Jackie Gleason before he died. He said that there were six vintage Coke freezers, which you see in the illustration there. And they had very small-looking beings that were three and a half to four feet tall. Some looked older than the others, Carrie, but most of them had the result of burns, some of them had slight dismembers to them. Uh, some of them were childlike looking, according to Jackie Gleason. He also stated that there were bins on the far portion of this facility, which you see in the illustration, Kerry. You'll notice that there's four bins with debris inside the, inside the bins. So just to be clear, Jackie Gleason did not see a crashed UFO, but he did see, according to himself, the remains of crew from a crash retrieval and the debris itself. And that is the 1973 Jackie Gleason alien encounter at Homestead Air Force Base. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, wonderful uh, illustrations. I, I uh, hope that people viewing this understand how valuable of a record this is for, uh, for people. And we'll, we'll go and pick up your book uh, when it's, it's downloadable as a PDF, I believe, and... Is it also going to be a hardcover book? I'd love it to go in that direction. Um, you know, I'm certainly open to everything, Carrie. As I mentioned to uh, Jan Harzan and everybody that's you know been following some of the, the work I've done. You know, I just want to get the information out there. I, I don't care about any type of financial reimbursement. I just the the way I look at it is the same way that James Forstall looked at it during that initial meeting of MJ12 members back in 1947 where he said that he felt that the public had a right to know this information, and that caused a ripple within the inner workings of MJ-12, and I, I think, Carrie, you know what happened after that. All right. All right. Right. Okay, so let's go to, we're going to go to the USS FDR case. Uh, this is page 39, Carrie. Okay. 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 According to Chester Grzynski, who is a U.S. Navy officer, <clears throat> this took place late 1958 off the coast of Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. I'm not making this up. We have his original 
uh, file within Springfield Collection and also within MUFON too. So we've got double redundancy backup on this case. This is the famous USS FDR UFO sighting. And I will point out, Carrie, that the USS FDR was the first aircraft carrier to carry onboard nuclear weapons. It had more than one UFO sighting uh, in its logbooks. And it's believed that the reason why UFOs seem to hover over this particular carrier was because it was carrying these nuclear weapons. And we've heard that through uh, different Air Force nuclear weapons launch sites where things were hovering over ICBM nuclear launch facilities as well. But that may be one reason. According to Chester Grzynski, at night, a very unusual light started approaching the aircraft carrier, and there was a huge commotion below decks to immediately get on top of the aircraft carrier deck. This is at night. Uh, according to Chester, he stated that there were 25 other eyewitnesses in addition to him, so that we've got multiple independent sources that this actually took place. As this light got closer and closer, uh, they also stated that they could feel the heat emanating off this craft onto their faces, and they were met with a 200-foot-long cigar-shaped craft with portholes along the side of the vehicle, probably on the opposite side as well. And according to the uh, military source, Mr. Grzynski, he stated that one of these portholes had beings that were looking back at him. And he said that one of these beings had his hand over his head like he was waving back at the people back down on the aircraft carrier. After about three minutes, this thing started uh, taking off. It turned an orange color carry and, and departed the area at a rapid rate of speed. Excellent. So, you know, I, I tend to think that since there's 25 eyewitnesses, eyewitnesses to that particular case that there's absolutely uh, something to it. Now, the other thing I should mention is the log books for that particular night have never been able to be uh, been acquired. So we don't have confirmation from the log books, but we have to go on the testimony from the 25 naval officers. Okay. okay. And, and and you have a drawing in the book here uh, by Chester Grzynski as well. That, that is his original sketch, Carrie. And, and if you look at the blow up, you can see the being, the humanoid being, looking out the window with his hand over his head like he's waving back. That is his original sketch. I didn't make that up whatsoever. So, uh, again, back at that time, who had the technology to create such a craft? Uh, obviously, it was exoatmospheric. It, it was designed to go somewhere. So it certainly left no sonic boom. There was no indication of any sound as it was hovering over the aircraft carrier. And this, this has actually been featured on uh, multiple History Channel documentaries as well. Okay. okay. Very good. Very good. Okay. So next, Kerry, I'd like to move on to the Walter Reed case. If we can, uh, let's see if we can get the correct page number for that one. Uh, let's see here. Now, I, I will mention that uh, in, in passing here, I, I've got a case within this collection uh, where a military source got off at the wrong floor at the Pentagon, and according to him, he saw an alien in a pickle jar at the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. He didn't provide any other information, just that that actually did occur. So it's just <laughs> another confirmation point of all this. Okay, page number, we need to go to 53, Carrie. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so the source for this one, Carrie, is Dr. Stanley Tytko. We, we can mention his name because we, we, he doesn't mention the, the name of the primary source. But according to Dr. Tytko, um, he was at Walter Reed Hospital. Well, actually, he, um, his source was at Walter Reed Hospital. This is during the 1950s. They were at the Cleveland Clinic when this actually, uh, this source mentioned that this took place. There was a series, uh, a group of other uh, medical professionals at the Cleveland Clinic. 
and they were they were just kind of standing around and they were joking about the UFO matter. They were just like joking at it and pointing fingers and they were stating that this whole thing is just all washed up. There's nothing to UFOs and anyone who believes in this uh, UFO subject is just uh, bonkers. It can't be true. However, the head person at this clinic overheard all this going on. And so he called his associate, Dr. Stanley Tyco, according to the uh, military witness here, he called him aside into his private office and he said, you know, Dr. Tyco, the subject of UFOs is not a laughing matter. In fact, back in 1953, I was commissioned by the United States government to perform a top secret autopsy on an alien cadaver at Walter Reed Hospital back in 1953. So... To him, it was not a laughing matter. Uh, Leonard received this report on May 30th, 1978. So we've got independent sources confirming that something did happen in 53. We know that there were two crash retrievals in Kingman in 53. So it's, it's conceivable, Kerry, that at least one or more of these cadavers made its way to Walter Reed and then eventually to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Fascinating. Okay. Okay. Let's go ahead and move on, Carrie. We want to go on to the film event. Uh, let's get the page number. Should be right next down the line here. We should be at page 54. And what you'll see there, Carrie, is a it's a photograph of a film archive. According to Jim Kibble, we can we can name this source. Uh, he had a contact, the Prime Minister of Australia, his name is Robert Hawke, and uh, he asked the Prime Minister of Australia if he could have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the Air Defense Minister of Australia. His name was Robert Hogg, and this meeting did take place, so this, this actually did happen. And according to Robert Hogg and Jim Kibble, he was shown a large collection of motion picture film reels kind of like a UFO warehouse, one of these big things that we've all been hoping for and wanting to find that, that physical evidence. He <laughs> said that there were, there were many, many, could be, could be up to 100, maybe thousands of uh, motion picture film reels there, and he was shown seven of these film reels, according to Jim Kibble. This is, uh, <clears throat> this is right around March of 1984 when this happened, according to the report. And I'll just highlight one of these films if you go to the next page, Carrie, you'll see a B-29, page 55. Now, the B-29s had a special, special designation when they flew over the North Pole Arctic region. They were called the F-13A, and this is confirmed by the late Wendell Stevens, who debriefed these crews as they flew over the North Pole. Their, their mission objective was to look for electromagnetic disturbances, and these, I will mention, Kerry, that these particular aircraft were highly modified. They carried high-definition cameras, high-resolution uh, motion picture film reel cameras, Kerry. They had electromagnetic monitoring equipment. These were packed full of very sensitive equipment. According to Jim Kibble, some of these films that were developed on these missions showed UFOs so closely that you could see the crew compartment on the UFO. And according to General Wendell, uh, Colonel Wendell Stevens, some of these motion picture film reels depicted these 100-foot diameter dish-shaped craft coming so close to the B-29 that they, they were near the trailing edge of the main wing and just ahead of the leading edge of the horizontal stabilizer pacing the B-29 with all the cameras rolling, carry. When these things landed, they were debriefed by Wendell Stevens, and then they were chained right to the wrist of an Air Force carrier and flown to Washington, D.C., probably the same location where later uh, Gordon Cooper's Edwards Air Force Base film also went as well, Kerry. Amazing. Amazing. So, great, great stuff. Great. Somehow, somehow, Kerry, we in the UFO community have got to get access to these films. Uh, right, I personally right. believe that we're never going to get anywhere in ufology if we don't get access to the physical evidence. We have got to get this bombshell evidence. We, we just can't be dealing with light reports anymore. 
We, we need the close encounter twos and three cases. We really need to get to the physical evidence, Carrie. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Incredible. Okay. What I'd like to do now, Carrie, is I'd like to go ahead and move on to another uh, well-known case. Uh, there was some new information that had been brought out on this case. I want to go ahead and go to that now. This is number 57, page number 57, Carrie. What you'll see there is an overhead shot of McGuire Air Force Base, New Jersey. Uh, Major George Filer will confirm this story because he was there the day that this actually took place. So we've got independent confirmation from the primary source and also George Filer. According to this source within the Leonard Springfield collection, uh, this, this actually took place on January 18th of 1978, very early in the morning, so it was still dark out, Kerry. Uh, one of the MPs on the base noticed that there were UFOs flying over the Fort Dix side. So I will mention that McGuire Air Force Base, New Jersey, and Fort Dix are together. They're, they're conjoined, so they're, they're adjacent to each other. They're very close. They're almost the same type facility. So this pol uh, military police brought his car over to the Fort Dix side. The next thing he knew, this UFO was hovering over his craft. About 30 seconds after that, he saw, it didn't ex explain how, but he saw an alien being with a tapered body and a bubble oversized head approaching his vehicle, Gary. He immediately panicked, got out of the car door, uh, pulled out his 45 caliber pistol and launched five rounds into this craft. And this particular being started running in the opposite direction. Somehow, Carrie, it had climbed over the, uh, the fence at McGuire Air Force Base, and it collapsed dead on the other side. So it was shot on the Fort Dix side, and then it collapsed on the McGuire Air Force side of the base. Um, and that is per the eyewitness. The, the body laid there limp and dead for approximately three hours. And then uh, before they decided what they would do with it. So if we go to the next particular page, so we're now at page 58. What happened next was they ended up taking a specially configured attachment on a forklift that had this shovel type attachment. They picked up the body. They placed the body on a concrete pedestal or like a stand. Then, Carrie, they built a wooden crate around the body, they sprayed the crate with a disinfecting agent, then they placed that crate into a metal container, that metal container was then put into the cargo bay of a C-141 that came from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and that particular C-141 Starlifter flew that body back to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and that is the McGuire Air Force Base alien chute, also at Fort Dix. Incredible. That, that particular story, Kerry, it just rings true to me. It sounds crazy, but there's multiple eyewitnesses. Um, we, we know that this is, this is exactly what they do. When they have a crash retrieval, when they have any type of thing like this, they, they cordon off the area. Uh, the, the cadavers are, are retrieved. They're packed. They're shipped out. So although this sounds crazy, um, there are other witnesses to corroborate this, including George Filer as well, Kerry. Okay, and, and there's, this is related by a security policeman on the base, correct? That is correct. That is correct. That is correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. That is correct. Okay, so if we can go to page 59, we should see a, a photograph of an X-15. This is April of 1962, Kerry. Never been disputed. Absolutely never been disputed. The pilot was a NASA pilot, Joe Walker. Uh, from Edwards Air Force Base when they were testing the X-15 rocket powered plane. On this particular flight, carry, they brought this X-15 up to over 200,000 feet altitude. They reached a speed of Mach 4.94. So keep this in mind. They're, they're going, you know, somewhere well over 3,000 miles an hour, absolutely, at such a high altitude. According to Joe Walker, and I've, I've got his quote here, he said that he encountered, quote, five or six cylindrical or dish-shaped objects which circled and paced his aircraft while he's going at Mach 4.94, Kerry. So I asked the question, 
who had the technology in 1962 to pace an X-15 going well over 3,000 miles an hour uh, at that altitude, at that speed. You know, I just, I want to put that out there. I'd like to get any information from someone who can, you know, provide some uh, corroborating uh, testimony on what they feel actually took place. Now, this was film. They, they got this on film as well. But uh, the fact remains, it did happen. There were other instances as well. And we, and we know that our U.S. Air Force pilots have tried to intercept these craft. A number of these pilots have been lost in these uh, different uh, interceptions. And so, again, we need to ask the question, why is it that the Air Force states that the subject of UFOs and UFOs in general represent absolutely no threat to the national security, but then when we try to send our own Air Force pilots to intercept these, many times they end up dead, Carrie. Uh -huh. Very incredible. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's, let's go ahead and move on here. Uh, I would like to review one other case that we sort of passed up here, but uh, I think it's probably important that, that we cover it as well. Let me try to get over to it here. Okay, so Fort Riley, Kansas, Kerry. Uh, if we go to page, uh, let's, let's go ahead and go to page 35. This is a, a highly debatable case. There's been a lot of people within the UFO community that, that stated that this never happened, this never took place, and that may be the case. I, I have to be totally honest, that, that may be the case. However, within the Springfield collection, there were two other eyewitnesses that corroborated this, so I felt it was important to, to, to mention it. According to Aaron Quebec, and, and we can name this case, on December 10th of 1965 at Fort Riley, Kansas. Okay, I'm eight. sorry, uh, can you hold on one moment? What page are we on? Uh, we're going to go right to page 35, Carrie. Page 35. And this concerns a Army guard at the time on December the 10th of 1965. According to this particular eyewitness, Kerry, he stated that um, he saw a Jeep approaching his area. The Jeep picked him up. They took him on a 10-minute ride to another location where there were two Army trucks standing by with other officers and military personnel. They all boarded these other two trucks. Then they took a 10-minute ride to where he said there was a clearing near this Fort Riley, Kansas area. And once they got there, what you see on page 35 is what he said he saw there. He said it was a hamburger-shaped craft. It was about 48 feet in diameter. It was 18 feet tall. It had a very strange fin appendage that started at the mid-portion of the disc and tapered back toward the end of the craft. On the lower section of that fin, there was looked to be an exhaust port type uh, appendage there. And then he said that there was these very interesting square blocks that were extruding or jutting out about 10 inches from the outer circumference of the craft. It had been sitting there at about a 15 degree angle. This all took place at night, according to the primary military eyewitness. He said that there was a Huey UH-1 helicopter that was shining a bright light down on this particular craft. <clears throat> and then he said that he was commanded to guard this thing during his duty time, which was about a four-hour period. He said that he got close enough to hit it with his rifle. He, I guess he didn't touch it, but he felt that the air surrounding the craft was a lot warmer than the other area that was in the immediate vicinity. Now, if we just conclude there... Uh, there might not be much of a story. But according to another eyewitness who was there on the same day, and this is why I'm going to bring it up, he stated that it wasn't just a few hours after that that he ran into a cordoned-off military barricade that had a sign over the front of it saying, no unauthorized personnel, and this is all in red letters. And he said that he saw the very same thing that Aaron Quebec had seen but now 
that particular craft was loaded up on a low boy tractor trailer, 16 wheel type device. It had a tarp over it and there were heavy chains covering the tarp to secure it and to conceal it from view. And he also said that there were military personnel with biological warfare suits and masks that were surrounding the whole thing. So Kerry, it appears that we have a secondary eyewitness to corroborate the original source. Oh, excellent. So I thought that was important that we mentioned that. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to the next case here. We've already covered the McGuire case. Um, I'd like to discuss very quickly page 66, Carrie. Now, we've all heard of Area 51. It's now become an international household name. But in 1980, Carrie, Area 51 was essentially unknown within the public domain. Um, it, it wasn't even mentioned. We, we really didn't know anything about it. It had not become a, a pop culture icon until the mid to late 1980s. But according to <clears throat> a letter received by Deborah Manneker, we can mention her, According to her, in 1980, a U.S. Air Force pilot had to make an emergency landing at Groom Lake. And anyone who's involved with, with flight testing in Nevada, whether it's red flag or anything the U.S. Air Force is doing, they are told immediately that any time you're doing exercises in this area of Nevada, you are to never, repeat, never land at Area 51 unless it's a dire emergency. And apparently there was an emergency in 1980 because this pilot had to, he had an engine out or something. He didn't say what mechanical problem he had, but he stated that he did have to make an emergency landing there. And when he taxied near the tarmac, immediately Kerry, he saw these hangar bay doors closing rapidly. Uh, he was blindfolded. He was removed from his aircraft. He stayed at this facility for some time. When his uh, aircraft was finally repaired, he flew out of there, and he was told to never discuss what, what he saw there. I don't know if he saw flying saucers and hangars, but he definitely stated that as soon as he got onto the tarmac, all these hangar doors started closing immediately. So they were absolutely conducting some type of operation or something was in these hangars that they wanted to conceal. And this really represents the, the first shot over the bow for Area 51, Carrie. Okay, very uh, interesting. interesting. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to the next one here. Uh, we've got accounts. Let's go to page 69. Okay. So what you'll see on page 69, Carrie, is a very interesting illustration done by Wes Crum. Wes Crum lives in Illinois. Uh, he's a good friend. He is a very talented sketch artist who has done tremendous amount of work on UFO stories. Uh, started doing this around 1984. By 1990 to 1994, he had created uh, literally dozens of these just brilliant museum quality sketches. One of them is here, and this depicts one of these cases here. Now, according to the eyewitness in the Leonard Springfield collection, he said that he knew a source who worked at Martin Marietta, which merged with Lockheed Martin to become Martin Marietta. This particular source knew of another source who claimed that he was a pilot on American UFOs. So that brings up the subject of Project Red Light, which is the alleged program to test fly UFOs. Now, it didn't technically mention whether they were extraterrestrial or man-made UFOs, but the point being is that this particular pilot said that he was test flying American UFOs. So if, if we keep that in mind, and then we keep in mind statements about Ben Rich, who stated just before he died that we have things in the Nevada desert that are 50 years beyond what you could possibly even dream of. I asked the question, you know, can Bob Lazar be lying after all this? I mean, should we reinvestigate Bob? Could, could the rumors surrounding Bob Lazar be true after all this? It's, it, it very may well be because we have another particular source here who indicated that he was test flying these dish-shaped craft. 
And we know, according to Bob Lazar, if his account is true at S4, he did witness the test flight of one of these disks. And he also specifically mentioned, Kerry, that during this test flight, he was near a military officer who had a walkie-talkie in his hand. And he was he maintained some type of communication with that disk. Now, he wasn't briefed on whether there was anyone in that disk or it was a drone, but the fact remains that there was some type of contact with that particular craft. So, Kerry, I want to move on to page 72 if we can. Okay. Okay. Seventy-two. Just want to show the photograph of astronaut Gordon Cooper. Again, just a couple of quick quotes from Gordon. I thought were very interesting to to mention here. According to Gordon Cooper, quote. Now, this is regarding the subject of UFO disclosure. He said, "Quote: Even money, a one million dollar offer to any taker with proof of a UFO outstanding by the National Enquirer, can't make people talk. I know. Just with the information I know." I wouldn't talk. You would never be the same person again, always looking over your shoulder. So even Gordon Cooper felt that he wouldn't reveal it either. So that's <laughs> sort of what we're up against here. Then he said, uh, this is through the dictation notes of Leonard Springfield, September 15th, 1978. He said, quote, the only way you could break this information is by a group of scientists willing to sign papers standing up and defying the military and intelligence groups, Kerry. And I totally agree. This is the only way we're ever going to see disclosure. We have to bypass these military intelligence groups. We have to overrule them, and we've got to get that technology into the hands of the scientific community. That's the only way it's going to work. Okay. Uh, that's an interesting approach. Uh, we're putting it out there right here and right now, and you are publishing this book. So, uh, you know, it's out there for people that want to find it. That's for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Next one I want to talk about here is number 76, page 76. This is a UFO crash retrieval at Fort Polk. This is in 1952. According to the primary source, he was a private in the Army with a platoon of other uh, soldiers at the time. They were conducting operations in that particular area. This is in Louisiana uh, back in 1952, according to the primary source. And he said that while they were doing this operation, they saw a dish-shaped craft that was about 24 feet in diameter, egg-shaped craft, crash near his area. They got to the scene. When they arrived on scene, they noticed that the outer circumference of this craft was still rotating. It was warm at the debris site, the crash site. He also mentioned that the lower portion of the disc was burned. It looked like it had been severely blackened or burned associated with the craft itself. And then, Kerry, he said that once military people were informed of this craft, this crash. There were medics, there were MPs that descended on the retrieval operation, and he said that he witnessed, along with his other uh, soldiers, he witnessed uh, two medics carry out an alien cadaver on a stretcher, and then he also stated that there were, uh, there were two other aliens that walked out under their own strength with the help of two other military police. So they were able to walk out under their own uh, power with just the aid of, of these military personnel. He did not know what happened after that because he was ushered out of the area, but he later learned, Carrie, that this particular craft was placed on an 18-wheeler tractor trailer a tarp was put on there, and then this whole thing was moved out of the area. So the point I want to make, Kerry, is we're seeing this same motif being repeated over and over again, where they have a crash retrieval, they cordon off the area, they bring in military personnel, they bring in a tractor-trailer low boy, they have a crane, they hoist the disc onto the trailer, they cover it up with a tarp, they secure it with either heavy chains or straps, and then they move it out of the location. And this is being repeated over and over again, Carrie. Right. right. Absolutely. And there's the 18-wheeler type of uh, crap. 
Correct. Okay. Correct. Correct. So, you know, we, we can see that by 1947, when they made their big mistake with Roswell about talking about what they had found, you know, apparently they had cleaned up their act and, and headed down to a royal oil machine. So I want to go ahead and move on, Carrie, if we can, to page 79. Interesting case, page 79. Okay. Okay, so page 79 is the entrance sign for Fort Hood in Texas. Very interesting to, to keep that in mind, Fort Hood in Texas. Now, within Fort Hood is something called Gray Army Airfield, very large complex. And within this Fort Hood, there's, there's a, uh, a facility with a runway called Gray Army Airfield. According to Tommy Blom, who is the primary source, um, he said that in the late 1960s, a private pilot had some type of engine trouble, and he made an emergency landing near Gray Army Airfield. This is back in the late 1960s, probably was a Cessna 172. And when he got there, he was met by military police in a Jeep. But he said as they were leading him out of the area, he saw these huge hangar bay doors opening up. But these were horizontally mounted here, carry, not vertically mounted in a hangar. They were, they were on the same level as the surrounding terrain. And there were like shrubs and, and low trees and uh, you know, basically the, the same type of terrain that was surrounding these hangar bay doors were on these doors themselves. So they blended in to the terrain. And he saw these doors opening up, which revealed a gigantic underground base within this facility. <laughs> right. uh, just incredible. Yeah. Now, according to Tommy Blonde, who wrote the entire report on this, it is his professional assessment that this is a staging area for U.S. built flying saucers. They were test flown from here. He also mentioned that uh, Black Hawk helicopters, um, U.S. Army CH-47 double rotor Chinook helicopters are based here. And what, when they do a test flight, they fly these helicopters that fly chase for these. And he believes, and, and I believe it too, Kerry, that this is the origin point for the Cash Landrum incident on December 29th of 1980 of Huffman, Texas, where three eyewitnesses suffered from the effects of radiation sickness when a 90-foot diamond-shaped craft flew by them, and it was chased by military helicopters, and I believe they came from this location, Kerry. Okay. Okay. And uh, I think he makes a very good case for, for that actually being, being the case. So if we can move to page 83, I, I do want to discuss that. I think it's important that we do. Okay. Okay. Page 83. This is an illustration that I commissioned John McNeil to do a couple years ago. Keep in mind, this is December 29th, 1980. There were three primary eyewitnesses. We have Betty Cash, Vicki Landrum, and Colby Landrum, approximately 9 p.m., driving down a dark road, when all of a sudden they saw a bright light approaching their vehicle, it got lighter and lighter, and all of a sudden the entire area completely was lit up, extremely bright. And what the primary eyewitnesses described was a 90-foot-tall diamond-shaped craft that looked like two ice cream cones carried put together end by end. The bottom surface of the vehicle was chopped off, and there was this blue flame coming out of the bottom of the vehicle. Every time the blue flame came out, this craft bobbed up and then it slowly bobbed back down again. And so Betty Cash got out of her vehicle, started walking toward the front portion of the, of the vehicle. She was there for about two minutes, saw this whole thing going on as the other two eyewitnesses inside the craft also saw, inside the car also saw this as well. And I will mention that this is late December so it was cold outside, but as this event was taking place, Carrie, it got so hot within the vehicle they had to turn the air conditioning on inside the car while this was taking place. As Betty Cash walked back to the car and she put her hand on the door handle, she immediately burned the skin off her hand. The entire exterior of the car became hot. Uh, once they got, once she got into the vehicle. 
they counted no less than 23 double rotor Chinook CH-47 helicopters chasing after this craft with high intensity powered searchlights as well. And I believe, Carrie, that the origin point for these craft came from that great Army airfield, a part of Fort Hood. And if we go down to page 85, Carrie, okay. Okay. what you'll see on the front part of page 85 is something called ANP funding. This I got from the Nuclear Aircraft Propulsion Program. And by 1960, according to this chart, the Atomic Energy Commission, the U.S. Air Force, and the United States Navy spent almost $1 billion on nuclear aircraft, atomic-powered uh, spacecraft. And if you go down a little bit further, Carrie, you'll see the second illustration on this page. It is a schematic drawing of an atomic liquid fuel rocket with subcritical reactor. And so, uh, Carrie, I personally believe that this is what caused the radiation sickness. There was some type of hull breach within the chamber of this reactor, and it started spewing out fissionable material, and that's what caused the three eyewitnesses to suffer the effects of radiation sickness. Okay. Very well-known case. It, it could perhaps be the most significant case in ufology. It's a very well-known case. Uh, debunkers cannot touch this case. It is essentially ironclad. All right. All right. So that, that uh, takes care of that one. Uh, I'd like to go ahead and move on to page 90, if we can, Carrie. Page 90, you'll see two jets in flight. Uh, this comes from Gordon Cooper himself. Uh, this was 1957. At Albuquerque, New Mexico, UFOs were tracked on radar. There were two jets in the uh, incident that were involved in this. And according to Gordon Cooper, this UFO, this dish-shaped craft, flew right in between these two jets. And he said that they flew so close that they could have clipped off the wings of these two jets. There was another jet nearby, which was a third one, who caught all this on film. This was photographed. That film has never been seen. So here's another case that Gordon Cooper had talked about. This is another one of those bombshell cases that we'd love to get access to, Carrie. So are you so, saying there's motion picture footage of this case? There, um, it, it, it didn't say that um, film reel, but uh, it looks like still photography was, was taken of this particular event. So something, something in the range of... Uh, Probably high color, eight by ten, black and white glossies were taken of this. And according to uh, Gordon Cooper, this thing flew right in between these jets, close enough to clip off their wingtips. So it must have been very close. That photo would would be the million dollar shot. Would be an incredible <laughs> shot. Sure, sure. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to the next part here. Okay, I'd like to go to page ninety one if we can. And what you'll see is the NASA logo, and you'll see a star constellation called the Boots Star Constellation. This is another quote from astronaut Gordon Cooper. According to Goop, uh, Cooper... Uh, okay, uh, so that's on the lower part of the page. The upper part has got uh, Condon. Yeah, we have Dr. Edward Condon and then the Condon Report, but I want to focus more on, on the... The bottom section there. Okay. Uh, this is this pertains to Gordon Cooper. According to Gordon Cooper, um, his quote revealed that uh, NASA believes that UFOs are extraterrestrial and that they they've been visiting this planet. And he also stated that we have been receiving signals from the Boots system and others. I believe that to be a bombshell statement carried from a, from a U.S. astronaut claiming that. NASA believes that UFOs are extraterrestrial and that they've been receiving signals from the boot star system. Um, it's just just simply incredible coming from him, a person of his caliber. Um, we also, if we move down to the next page, Carrie, this is page 92. Okay. Now, this is something that... Uh, 
Gordon Cooper told Leonard Stringfield. It says, Len, don't be too shocked if we announce that er Einstein's theory is no longer valid, that we've overcome the speed of light block in a limited way in the next 20 years. Okay, so think about that, Carrie, that they have probably overcome the speed of light barrier. This is essentially a word-for-word -word repeat that Ben Rich talked about on March 23, 1993, at the UCLA Alumni Club. He stated, quote, there is an error in the equations, and we have figured it out, and now know how to travel to the stars, and it won't take a lifetime to do it. So if you put these two together, Carrie, they have made the breakthrough. They have made the breakthrough. And the, and the source for this is none other than new fund international director Jan Harzan was there personally when Ben Rich made that statement. Okay, excellent. So I think they have made the breakthrough, Carrie. They have figured out uh, interstellar, intergalactic space travel. They have, they have somehow, even Tom Keller had talked about how Lockheed Skunk Works had hired teams of theoretical mathematicians to address these issues of, of uh, you know, rapid response space travel into intersolar systems. They've definitely made the break, breakthrough, what's uh, no doubt about it. Right, right. Okay, so I'd like to move to the next case, Carrie, which would be on page 104. And at this time, you're, you're choosing cases for a particular reason. Is that correct? I'm picking the best of the 112 cases. Okay. That's what I'm doing. And the point I want to make is there are 112 cases within this book that I felt were worthy enough to include an illustration. Um, and all we need, Carrie, is one of these cases to be true. And the case for non-existence of extraterrestrials completely falls apart. So all we need is one case. <laughs> so I asked the listening audience, if you went to Vegas and you knew, you knew the odds were 112 to 1 in your favor, would you win? Would you go back month after month, year after year? You can't lose. All we need is one case carried to be true. Okay, so on page, on this page here, which is 104, you'll see a gun camera. According to Leonard Stringfield, he was giving a, a lecture at a pilot's meeting, and one of these pilots approached him and stated, uh, Leonard, I was at uh, the Pentagon working for the Department of Defense, and one day I saw a stack of high-resolution photographs on a, on a desk. They were probably 8 by 10 black and white glossy. He believed them to be of very high quality, uh, they detected dish-shaped craft, other type vehicles, and he believed, it was his assessment, this uh, pilot, that they were gun camera footage photos, perhaps taken um, in World War II or maybe as late as the Korean War. But So it just indicates that they did have those photographs at that time. And we know if they had one, they probably have thousands carried. Absolutely. They're, they're definitely covering up their gun camera footage without any question whatsoever. They, they definitely are doing that. <laughs> uh, okay, okay I, I'd like to move on to, this is an interesting thing I think it's important we mention, page 109. Page 109 is a photograph of none other than Howard Hughes and a photograph of Area 51, top view looking down. According to this source, this comes uh, April 11th, 1980. Jim Gray is the source, and his, he related that his father lived in Nevada in the 1950s, right across the mountain range from Groom Lake. And he said that during this time, for months at a time, Carrie, according to this source, between 8 and 9 p.m., he saw... UFOs hovering over the mountain range, dipping down, making high-speed maneuvers, and it was the assessment of Jim Gray's father that the CIA was conducting a joint UFO project, whether that's a reverse engineer project or a test flight project, at Groom Lake Area 51 during that time frame, 
and they were using the technology from the Hughes Aircraft Company. And that's something that hasn't been mentioned before, Kerry, as far as I know, because we usually talk about Lockheed Skunk Works or we talk about uh, Northrop or even McDonnell Douglas, but the Hughes Aircraft Company is very rarely mentioned in con conjunction with the CIA in UFO operations. Uh, okay, uh, well, that, I know from personal experience that that's a mistake. In other words, that Hughes Aircraft was heavily involved in, uh, in, in the secret space program. You're saying that that's that they're not involved in the secret space. That they thing? are. That they are. Uh, so. And they were. I, at least they were. were. It, that's I mean, my understanding. If, if, you look at, if you look at what they were doing, they had a lab at Area 51. They were doing classified research on submarines, radar. They were doing missile research. They had multiple classified contracts with the government. Um, I, I think it's entirely consistent that they were perhaps uh, involved with the CIA in this operation as well. It, it, it's very possible. Yes. So you're saying that that's not possible, Carrie? Or? No, I'm saying yes. I'm, I'm saying you're correct. Okay, okay. <laughs> Just to be that's fine. You know, what, what did Harry, Howard Hughes know about Area 51, Carrie? Have you heard anything at all? Uh, no, Have you heard I don't anything think from I don't. Your sources regarding involvement and what he knew. I mean, he was a very mysterious figure, but surely he knew something. Okay, I, I don't know what he knew about Area 51. Uh, I do know that he's depicted in a, a an episode of Dark Skies. You're right about and that. And they did a tremendous amount of background research before they released that series, uh, which was taken off the air. At, some people won't know that it was actually broadcast along the same time when the X-Files was coming out. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it was a very different approach to the whole story, but they, they, they packed every incident with history, actual history that's, you know, known in the public domain, and then they matched it with uh, research that they'd done and, and put it into a fictionalized account, supposedly fictionalized. I have to say it's... Uh, it's stunning to watch it and uh, very, very accurate based on uh, the information that Camelot has. Yeah, that, that sounds great, Kerry. I, I, I concur with that. I've seen that episode of Dark Skies, and uh, Howard Hughes is uh, highlighted there. <laughs> I just wanted to make the point that we, we within this community, we always hear about the same contractors. We hear about Lockheed. We hear about McDonnell Douglas. We hear about Boeing and Northrop and Rockwell. We just never hear about the Hughes Aircraft Company. It's just so rarely mentioned. And maybe they're the ones taking a lead on this project. It's very possible because they're always deep black. They're always classified. They're under the radar screen. If you look at historical references regarding the Hughes Aircraft Company, they're very hush-hush. They do a lot of classified work for the government. Yeah. So it stands to reason that they could be deeply involved in this particular subject. Yes. Okay, let's go to, let's go to 123 period. Okay. Really interesting case. If we go to page 123, you will see a photograph of the Great Lakes Naval Station north of Chicago, Illinois. According to the source from Leonard Stringfield, a U.S. Navy guard, this is in 1973, was guarding a particular Quonset style hangar at this facility on the northwest corner of the station. He specifically said northwest corner. He was commanded to deliver a message to the commander officer who was in that particular hangar. And so when he got inside, he was met by these two muscular guards who brought him down a corridor that was a long corridor. Then they made an immediate 90 degree left hand turn to another long corridor. And when they got to the end of that corridor, Kerry, he said that it opened up into a large hangar type facility. And at the back portion of this hangar type facility, sitting on what looked like wooden crates was a very unusual craft 
which you'll see, Carrie, if we go to the very next page, which is 124. He said that this was a teardrop-shaped craft that was stretched lengthwise. It was 35 feet across. At its thickest portion, it measured 12 feet high. It was completely seamless, essentially. It was glowing with a white glow, but there was a blue tint to it as well. And then he said that there was this flange that ran along the outer portion of the craft that stopped about three feet back from the trailing Hello? Okay, I guess we've lost Michael. We're going to get him right back. Uh, hold on one minute. Bring everything back up again. Uh, so we've got you here. Uh, I need to, to see if I can get you on the screen uh, video. So one moment. And thank you for, for listening, everyone. Uh, we've been pretty lucky here that most of this broadcast has gone without incident. So uh, at the moment, Michael, do you think that we can get you on video? Uh, how's it looking at your end? Uh, let's see. We should be there, Carrie. Uh, let's take a look here. Yep, should be there. Okay, so, so you're back. All right, so okay. uh, you want to just briefly introduce this uh we were just talking about this uh teardrop drop shaped ufo right correct this is this was seen by a u.s navy guard in 1973 at the great lakes naval training center now the reason why i bring this up carrie is because we have corroborating evidence if you go down one page right to page 125 i've got a picture of the U.S. Navy 32nd Naval Street Station in San Diego. According to this source, he also met a naval officer who claimed that he was on a naval vessel in 1973 between San Diego and Hawaii where a UFO was shot down and it was towed all the way back to San Diego at this particular naval base. <clears throat> and he said that Later, when researchers uh, discussed this matter with the primary source, he stated that the picture that this source from San Diego drew for him was the exact same craft that he saw in 1973 in Chicago. So, Kerry, we have two sources for this particular case of a UFO shootdown. Fascinating. And I've never been able to find a drawing of that. So, the drawing that that we showed on 124 is based off the primary eyewitness testimony. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to the next case, Carrie. Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and move on to, we're gonna go to page 139, Carrie, if we can. Okay, this, this comes from a source from Bell Labs. This is part of the Leonard Springfield collection. He stated that he was on a flight line of a U.S. Air Force base in the early 1950s when a crash retrieval was brought onto the base. And then he said that he saw a cutaway drawing of this particular alien craft. And he said that he also saw a headband transceiver that the aliens wore over their heads which was the liaison connection between the brainwave frequencies of the aliens and the flight controls of the vehicle. So somehow they had figured out how to bypass flight controls. And what you see in this picture is based off the very well done research by my friend Mark McAnlish, who did the original alien reproduction drawing right. that has really gone worldwide now, Carrie. But the point I'm trying to make is it's very possible that the navigation bowl system used on the alien reproduction vehicle was sort of a poor man's way of duplicating the alien transceiver that they used 
to monitor the brainwave frequencies that actually move the flight controls of the flying saucer. This is the best we could do in the mid-1950s. And that, that appears to be something that they worked on at that time. One of the primary sources indicated that these vehicles had been around for decades. So it looks like back then, in the 1950s, they couldn't quite figure out that brainwave transceiver technology. And so this was kind of a quick patch or, or a fix at that particular time period. Okay. Uh, it says that it was uh, a, a source from Bell Labs, correct? A source from Bell Labs. That's correct. Yes, very interesting. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to the next case, Carrie. And we've, we've got just a couple more to cover here. And I think we've, we've really done a good job uh, covering these a, as we go along. Let's go ahead and move on to page one. Let's go to page 152, I believe it is. 152, Carrie. Okay. The source for this, uh, his initial is S, since we can't reveal the, the name of the source according to Leonard's original agreement with his sources. But he stated that uh, there was a top secret flight of the SR-71 Blackbird in 1978 over the west coast of America, where NORAD tracked a UFO in its vicinity. And so the pilot of the SR-71 was vectored to the location of the UFO. So keep in mind, they're traveling at Mach 3.1, which is 2,000, over 2,000 miles an hour. They're probably at 90,000 feet, and they're chasing after this area, uh, this UFO. All of a sudden, Carrie, the engine blows. One of the engines on the SR-71 blows, and they didn't want to lose the craft or the pilots, so they canceled the intercept. But this was caught on radar. NORAD was tracking all this, and they didn't want to lose the pilot, so it was called off. So, again, we need to ask the question, Kerry, who had the technology in 1978 to outpace a Blackbird going Mach 3.3 plus <laughs> at 8,000 feet back in 1978? It certainly know. appears that it, it wasn't an Air Force plane. I uh, don't know if it was anything Soviet, but... It, it did take place. Uh, it was tracked on NORAD's radar. So somewhere in Cheyenne Mountain, there is probably a radar tape of this event, which would be very valuable. Right. right. Somewhere. They've, they've definitely got these tapes somewhere. There, there's no question about it. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to the next one here, Carrie. Let's go to page 160. One sixty. I have a photograph of a warehouse carry. The source for this came. He came from Charles Wilhelm, who stated that he interviewed a clerk at Wright Patterson Air Force Base. Um, she was there between the nineteen forties and nineteen fifties. Uh, she retired in nineteen fifty nine, and she told Charles Wilhelm that during this time, these, these are her words that she cataloged over 1,000 components from a UFO crash retrieval at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. These items were bagged, tagged, and photographed and put into a large warehouse at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And then she also said that just a few months before she died, this is her remark, quote, Uncle Sam can't do anything to me once I'm in my grave. <laughs> so she felt, I've got nothing to lose, I'm going to go for it. That's the kind of witness testimony we need. So, Carrie, we have got to figure out a way to get access to that physical evidence and blow the cover up. Yeah, yeah. very good. Very. Great, stuff. Great stuff. Okay, so let's do one more, Carrie, and we're going to go to page, let's go to page 165. Leonard Springfield Collection. This is Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Uh, 1955, could have been 1953, so I want to make that as well. This was a DC-7 that landed at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base at night, taxied up onto the tarmac, where this particular military guard claims that he saw a forkload offload 
four crates. Two of the crates carried the alien cadavers of two male aliens and then one female alien cadaver. And he said that the tops of these crates were transparent. They had some type of bubble transparent dome on them so he could see inside, or they may have been totally open. Uh, and he, he was told that the remaining two crates were going to be shipped to the Redstone Arsenal in Alabama. So we've got at least 24 witnesses within the Leonard Springfield collection of either alien cadavers being shipped to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base or the resulting crash and debris being shipped to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Jerry, I don't believe that all of these sources uh, can be lying. Uh, I'd love to hear from anyone who has first-hand knowledge of this information as a way of corroborating these cases. And my ultimate goal is to get this information into the hands of the scientific community so that the propulsion systems associated with these vehicles can be brought out to improve the quality of life of everyone on this planet, Carrie. Okay, uh, excellent work, Michael, and I highly recommend this book. There's a lot uh, more to the book, and the, the, the detail is here. I'm just noti noticing that they say there were two male aliens and one female, uh, four feet in length. Correct. And they had uh, long faces, darkish green. Correct. Correct. So, so there's more detail to be had, everyone, uh, than what we are getting here on this uh, relatively brief uh, but uh, very careful uh, live discussion we're having with Michael about his his new book that's about to be released tomorrow for on the MUFON website, and uh, we will provide the link on Camelot as well as, I wish we had the link at this moment, uh, do you know what area of the site it'll be on or any direction? It will absolutely be featured on the main page. Okay. Absolutely. You won't have to dig for it. Okay. Uh, so what is their normal UFO? Uh, I mean, UFO. <laughs> Obviously got my name, my mind on UFOs. Uh, URL uh, for the MUFON site. It'll be MUFON.com. Okay. So M-U-F-O-N.com. Correct. Okay, so that, that'll be coming out sometime tomorrow, you believe. Is that correct? It's going to be early this week, very much so, yes. Okay. It, it will be on there. It absolutely will be on there. Okay, very okay. good. Okay. Uh, all right, well, we do have an audience here in the chat. Uh, I don't know if anyone has questions. I would ask them to put them in all caps if you do. And uh, we've been going for quite a while, so we don't want to take too much more of Michael's time. But we do have time for a few questions. If there's anyone who has any burning questions that you want to ask Michael uh, right here and right now, just please type them quickly into the chat, and uh, we'll wait long enough to, to for you to do that. Um, I, I want to get in, Carrie, that thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to join you on this. Thank you very much, Carrie. Oh, you're, you're very welcome. And... Uh, and, it, you know, it's a delight, really, to, to be honest with you, Michael, because uh, the kind of work you're doing here is so important to ufology in general, but also to humanity. And uh, and we must not lose our history, all right? And, uh, of course, the cover-up continues, as everyone knows. There are, are disclosures every now and again. Uh, those are fraught with disinformation, as most people will will know as well. So, so we really want to be able to put this information out. Investigators like Michael are a very rare breed, as you can appreciate, and, um, and, and we should definitely honor them and, and, and support their work in every way we can. And so that's what we're trying to do here at Project Camelot. Uh, so if you're enjoying this broadcast and you appreciate our work, please do consider making a donation to Project Camelot to make uh, our work possible in the future along these lines. Uh, this is a free broadcast and we will be putting it up on YouTube as soon as we can you know, manually get it onto YouTube uh, after the broadcast. So um, at this time, I'm, I'm just gonna be looking in the chat and seeing what we can see as far as questions. Uh, someone is asking about the Del Rio crash in 1950. Um, there, there is a reference to that, Carrie, and I'm going to leave that to the readers to get the uh, specific details on that particular case, but it is referenced within the Springfield collection. Okay. All right. Great. Okay. Um, so I'm looking over here. Uh, 
what is your own personal experience, sightings, etc.? I can't say I've seen an extraterrestrial UFO carry. I, I just, I haven't seen it. Uh, most of what makes it real to me is just talking to Skunk Works engineers who've worked on classified programs. That's what really makes it uh, real to me. People like Ben Rich, who made those statements, uh, it really drives home the point. But I personally have not seen uh, a UFO carry. I have not. Incredible. Okay. I should take you uh, UFO hunting, Michael, because they exist. And uh, don't you live in Arizona? I can highly recommend, uh, I believe that Melinda Leslie is still uh, taking people out on, on UFO excursions. She is, yes. she is. And, and you'd be sure to see them in Sedona. I can guarantee you that as I used to live there. Uh, so let's see what else. Um, well, that looks like all I see in, in caps, um, I, I'm seeing if there's anything. I, I guess somebody is asking something about um, information about Bell Labs reverse engineering. Only from what we covered, Carrie. That's all. The, the only reference I have is that particular case that we covered. That's the only one that mentioned Bell Labs. Oh, really? Interesting. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, and what about your travels uh, otherwise? Have you, have you ever you know, tried to interview somebody from Bell Labs? I technically have not. I've been focusing most of my time on the Lockheed Skunk Works engineers because I, I personally think they're closest to the information above any other uh, defense contractor, per Ben Rich comments. Okay, fair enough. Uh, all right, people, if, if there's anything else, um, let's see, idea, they want to know if you have ideas about bases on the moon. Well, if we're to believe the stories regarding the alien reproduction vehicle and what Ben said and the three-star general who was giving the lecture at the exhibit at Lockheed's L-1011 hangar on November the 12th of 1988, who stated that these craft had uh, faster than speed of light travel, Kerry, I believe we do have bases on the far side of the moon. I, I absolutely do. Uh, I think it's a done deal. We have been hoodwinked. We have been had. Our, our history has been stolen from us. Countless trillions of dollars have been poured into black programs, which is something that Kennedy was very well aware of. This is something that Eisenhower warned us of. And so these programs have gone rogue. And the only way to stop it, and I'm in total agreement with Gordon Cooper, is to get that technology into the hands of the scientific community. We've got to bypass the military and intelligence uh, apparatus. Okay, fair enough. Uh, let's see. Somebody wants to know something about the headband. What is? Only, only from what that particular uh, gentleman had mentioned, that they were wearing some type of a mental transceiver around their heads, and that apparently worked as a way to identify the brainwave frequency of the extraterrestrials, and that bypassed any mechanical flight controls. But back in 1955, we didn't have the technology to do what they were doing, so we created an alien reproduction vehicle using off-the-shelf components within the aerospace industry that were already pre-existing. That's the best we could do in 1955, but decades later, I think we've bypassed that, and we probably do have the technology to do it where we can just go right into the brainwave frequencies and bypass manual flight controls. Absolutely. Uh, there's, there's other evidence of this, by the way, that has to do with uh, a link up with, uh, you know, between the mind and the computer uh, right. and, and re remote viewing. And uh, if you talk, read, watch our interview with Dan Sherman, uh, they were doing all kinds of uh, work with computers, with moving things around, even in those days. Um, so, and I think even now, games, uh, games are, are, are linking up with uh, the minds of young people who are playing these computer games, and they're, they're doing some, some things in that nature, even in the public domain. You can imagine if they're doing that in the public domain, what they're doing and have yes. been doing for years and years behind the scenes uh, in the secret space program. Absolutely. So uh, someone wants to know, what about the teenager who worked on the plasma biological engine? Uh, you're talking about, uh, I know the case well, but I, I can't comment on it because I don't know him personally, but I have heard of that case before, yes. And I forgot that guy's name. 
Okay. Yeah, I know who you're talking about. Um, Maximilian de la Fayette talks about the Nazis developing the headband technology, specifically uh, Maria Orsic, they're saying. Uh, that could be the case. The, the Bell source didn't mention that, but I have to keep it open. So I, I can't uh, comment on that, something I don't know. Okay. Um, all right, so at this time, we've been taking quite a while with this broadcast, so, so I'm going to let you go, Michael. I um, want to thank you so much for, for the, all the work that you've done, your contribution to our history and to preserving our true history. Uh, and uh, I think everyone seconds that for me uh, and for you. So at this moment, um, any last parting words? Just want to get the word out there. Uh, I'd like to, I think we should try to come together as a group and identify more of these. Uh, the other thing is we need to get to the Springfield primary source material because what we presented here tonight comes from the 65-3 ring binders. This is the dictation notes, day-to-day -day type notes, which is very good information, very rare, but the real information that we'd really like to get are the 40 bank boxes that are under the jurisdiction of Dell Springfield. That's the ultimate goal, is to identify more of these military sources before they pass away so that we can preserve an important part of our national history. That's right. And that means uh, your parents, your grandparents, uh, and, and even aunts and uncles and, and people that you know that are in your family could be involved in this, especially if you're in the California area. Uh, you could likely have a person who worked in aerospace or has a history behind uh, the scenes in the, that perhaps they've never revealed. Uh, this information is our history. It belongs to humanity, to all of us, and, uh, and we should have access to it. So thank you very much, Michael Schratt, and uh, everyone have a great night. Thanks, Gary. Okay, and please do go buy his book. Uh, it'll be very low priced, isn't that right, uh, for a PDF download. Yeah, I think it's going to be nine ninety nine, dollars very modest. Okay, okay. And, and Michael has gone to an absolutely tremendous amount of work, so uh, thank you very much, Michael. Thanks, Carrie. All right. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you.